Consider the words from the Collect, wherein we ask God, who is more ready to hear than we to pray, and aren't want to give more than either we desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask. For the first time in a long time, this clock acknowledges that we are to continually to pray to God, asking Him for what we want. Yet how often do we listen to Him when He responds with what we need? If we will listen to Him and do what He asks, He will give us more than we have need of, more than we can ask for, and more than we can even desire. The point of the Collect is that he has unlimited resources for this, and also able to forgive us for things of which are bearing on our conscience, yet it requires us to listen to him and then act upon what we are told. When we ask his forgiveness, when he gives it, we need to accept it and live it. If we live in the past, we will never benefit. The only place we can accept is in the present in the here and now. The Collect also acknowledges that God is more ready and inclined to listen to us than we are to pray to Him. This is a sad but simple truth. We are called to pray to God more often in asking Him for what we need, not just what we want. Want and need are two different words, often used interchangeably, which is incorrect. When we do pray to God, He'll give us far better answers than we could ever dreamed up ourselves, and if we act upon His words and take them to heart, the results will be more amazing and epic than we could have ever possibly imagined. As we all know, the past has already happened. It is unchangeable, set in stone. The future has not yet happened, but can only be influenced through our actions in the present. This is why worrying about the future and the past is pointless. We cannot influence things that have already happened and things that are undetermined to happen. We can only influence things in the present. We can only use the past as a data point to learn from. We cannot make any further changes. To use computer speak is read only and not read and write. The present is where we can read and write and make changes to our lives. Dwelling on the past does not help solve the problems of the present or the future. We must take the lessons of the past, but then once learned, look no more back but forward to what we can do in the present, the only realm of time in which we can actually influence every influence anything. How do we learn? Luckily for us, God gives us the guidance to learn through the Holy Ghost, if we will but accept it. He gives us the power to act in the spirit of the law. The law, or actually 613 little laws, turned out to be in and of itself a death sentence. The Jews could not or would not comply with the 613 Mosaic laws, which brought them death. The law brought death. But the New Testament of Jesus Christ brought us life, true everlasting life. Very much like in our society today, too many Jews only cared about not violating the law, not about the spirit of the law which was intended. People today have a tendency to want to be a law-abiding citizen and not break any laws. They forget about the spirit of the laws. Following the letter of the law does not save an individual. Following the spirit of the law is what counts. If you follow the spirit of the law, you are following what the law was meant for. Jesus is the ultimate embodiment of the law. As the embodiment of the law, he gave us the important bits of the law, when he gave us the summary of the law, which through him would bring life, everlasting life, and happiness here on earth. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Only two laws to comply with, which though simpler are harder. Number one, 
love God. Number two, love your neighbor like yourself. There is no getting around these two laws, no loopholes in these laws. They are very plain and very clear. If you follow those two laws, there is not much other guidance. The Ten Commandments themselves spring from these two laws as a moral base. Loving God and loving your neighbor like yourself will greatly improve your life and others around you if you consistently follow it. The summary of the law is the spirit of the New Testament, which is we are to love God and love our neighbors. There are both things seemingly contrary to our sinful nature, but with the help of the Holy Ghost, they can be overcome. There are also both things that will greatly improve our lives here on earth. If not in a monetary sense, most certainly our lives will be improved spiritually if we follow the summary of the law. If you understand the big picture, you will know what you need to do to make the little picture line up with his world. Our problem is like the Jews, we cannot perfectly line up our world with his because we come from the same common ancestor, Adam. We have the curse of free will. Luckily for us, we have the Holy Ghost. He could be so useful for us in putting course of change corrections to us. We just need to listen to his input and act upon it accordingly. In the gospel, Jesus helped a deaf man from the pet, an impediment of speech. It is a parable in of itself. The deaf man is a stand-in for us. We who cannot seemingly hear God's commands or won't. Our speech impediment is that we have sin that sin causes us to utter offensive or wrong things in our day-to-day -day lives. We are asking for him to heal us of both spiritual impediments. Without his help, we cannot be clear of our spiritual deafness and uncleanliness. If we will allow him into our hearts, Jesus Christ will remove that spiritual block that causes spiritual deafness and uncleanliness. The key phrase here is that we have to allow him into our hearts. He won't come in uninvited. We have to, on our own will, willingly invite him in. Only then can he start the cleansing process. The point of the gospel is that we need to ask him to remove our spiritual impediment of sin and open our ears, hearts, souls, and minds to his word. Only then can we be truly in the position to act for him here on earth. The Holy Ghost is a large part of our spiritual lives. Without him, we could not be considered one of Christ's sheep. He is the one who communicates from God to us in how we are to act on this earth. He helps guide our spiritual paths and advises, advises us on the correct actions to be taken. We have to let him into our hearts and lead the transforming and renewal of our minds. Without his help, we cannot accurately follow him. In other words, we are doomed without the help of the Holy Ghost, which will give us his guidance and advice in conducting our church, professional, and personal lives. When Jesus opened the ears and mouth of the deaf mute, he did for him what the Holy Ghost will do for us. If we will but let him open first our ears to hear, then our mouths to testify, communicate, and direct. We must lead people toward God, not push them. Thus, we need to strive, each of us, to follow God more closely so we can pull on the lead rope. Leading requires being in front of the people you're attempting to lead, having them follow your example towards an objective. Study Jesus' life. He is a perfect example of a leader. We can't, cannot ever be perfect, but we can strive for that perfection in our actions. Action counts. For by their actions ye shall know them. Heaven is at the end of an uphill trail. The easy downhill trail does not lead to the summit. Time is now, not tomorrow. Time has come indeed. How will you act? Inspire actions when you're known. Be of God, live of God, act of God.